Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us one of my absolute favorite people, Mike Cernovich, author of Gorilla Mindset, producer of Hoaxed, uh, and other films we're going to talk about in a second. Um, influencer, you are actually one of the people who could call yourselves an influencer and not be ironic or douchey about it. There are less than 10 people on earth who, if I had an issue, I would call them up and trust their judgment and just do what they said. And you're one of those people. And I think it's important um, because they've been trying to make you more controversial than you are and marginalize you that to, when people have done right by you and have made your life better, I think it's really um, vile that as soon as there's any kind of difficulty, they scurry like cockroaches. It's like if someone's done you a solid and you don't, kind of have their back what kind of a person are you so as you have become more prominent on the internet and so on and so forth have you had that happen people throwing you under the bus not overtly thrown under the bus but not noisy defenses either which in fairness to them i've actually texted people like celebrities and stuff who've retweeted me and i was like you need to take that down and they're like, what do you mean? I go, just trust me. Just trust me. The hell storm will come your way. Yeah. But, so I definitely haven't been like necessarily backstabbed, but the people who are in a position like, so for example, if you're a famous actor or something, you do not need to retweet Mike Cernovich. Like, please don't make all, please just make a lot of money and have impact and do great things. Don't get canceled for me. But then there are people who are like, objectively more controversial than I am who anytime there's a little bit of heat thrown my way, they're hiding out. That that's the, the usual dynamic of play. But I, you know, I take the Gavin approach too, which is people have their own lives. People don't even know if you're going through something. Yeah. There, there's this idea that, cause I've been through the media, you know, was cycle so much. The first time it happens, I'm like, where are my friends? And then you realize they're living their lives. Nobody, <laughs> Because to you, it feels like a big deal. You're like, everybody's hating me. My God, I'm under like siege. But none of my friends are even reading it. <laughs> they don't even know. They don't even know that like, they're like, we don't, you know, you think we read these publications? Like, why would we even know what really is going on? That, that, that's, so it's usually they don't know what's going on or, you know, or they're like living their own lives. Or two is they just, you know, they kind of want to lay low because they don't want to be the, what, what is it? The, the long leaf of grass gets to cut. Yeah, the tall poppy syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think there's also this idea of, you know, we always, everyone says Twitter isn't real life. Like, and this has happened to people I know where they're getting kind of dogpiled and everyone's attacking them on Twitter. And I say, they're like, how do you handle this? And I go, no one cares. And the people attacking you don't even care. Like they'll swarm you for two days. They'll all vanish. Maybe one or two will hang around because they got some engagement and they think they've got a target to hang on to like a lamprey, but this is not about you. And it's very hard to understand that when you are at the epicenter. Well, your brain is, it's sort short circuiting your brain. Just imagine like there are days that there have been thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands who like felt like they hated this avatar of who they believe Mike Cernovich was. And any other time in the world, you would be dead. You, you only need what? In a Dunbar number of 150, yeah. you piss off three people, you're dead. Next hunting trip, you're going to fall off a cliff. So in your mind, you're like, everyone hates me. And it's like, no, first of all, they don't even hate you. They hate an avatar. Two is that's such a small percentage at scale. So the way I put it is that if you're a public figure, you deal with humanity at scale, right? We'll throw in our, our big tech, we're disruptors. You know, we'll throw in our, our big tech VC, right? Fucking cliches. But we're it really- crushing it, bro. We're crushing it. <laughs> we're crushing it, bro. We're fucking disrupting. But you deal with 
humanity at scale. So if there's like a fucking piece of shit, you're going to find that piece of shit. And that piece of shit really will try to make your life hell and do things that you could never imagine doing to your worst enemy, let alone a stranger on the internet. But then the flip side is you're going to meet the most amazing people that you have, you never would have met, had a chance to meet in your small town or even a big city. So, but everything's at scale. And then once you realize that and you internalize and contextualize it, you realize, yeah, so there's like a few people are mad, but like 5 million people are probably reading today and they don't even know what people are mad about or they don't even really care. So why, why do I want to focus on that like minutia? But it takes a while. You really do have to train your brain to look at it that way. One of the ways you got your start, uh, which people might not realize, was finding ways to help young men thrive and better themselves, which I think, you know, it's very derisively referred to as like manosphere and all this other stuff. And we, you, when I interviewed you for my book, you talked about this. There's this kind of attempt where it, on the one hand, like, oh, you're a loser. Right. And then when you're like, okay, I'm a loser, I'm going to try to not be a loser. It's like, oh, you're pathetic. You think you're so persecuted. It's like, well, if I'm a, what, which is it? Am I a loser and I'm wrong for trying to not be a loser? I'm not a loser to begin with. It's this complete contradiction. Um, as I've been coming up, kind of, I'm like a few steps behind you uh, in terms of metrics and influence, or whatever. I'm finding that there are so many of these like young men who I relate to because when I was their age, I didn't have these figures to kind of talk to. I'm sure you've experienced that a lot. And what's kind of the biggest piece of advice is you, of advice that you've been given to them? Well, what I always what I always tell people. So first of all, let's take a step back before I answer that. Is the, the big bias too against like, oh, you're a loser, but how dare you change yourself is the bias against like self-help. So people are derisively say Mike Cernovich self-published a self-help book. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you're a fat, disgusting pig. Why do you think you're throwing shade on me? You know, like, I, I'm like, your fucking life is a mess. You're an alcoholic. You're addicted to cigarettes. You look like a slob. Like it, I, I'm doing okay. You know, like, but, but that's the idea is uh, I always say, like, if you, Michael Malice, told your friends, hey, I'm going to go to this, you know, like, workshop today and learn how to do whatever, people be like, cool. Oh, you're going to learn how to, like, code. Sounds cool. How was it? But if you're like, you know what? I'm going to wake up on a Saturday and just learn how to be a little bit more self-confident. Even your own friends are going to give you a side eye. Right, like, yeah, what yeah. kind of loser would ever need that? It's the idea that it isn't a, a set of skills. So what I what I tell people is that, the number one lesson that you can learn is that living a better life is a skill that you can learn. It's yes. objectively a skill. There are just certain things that you can do that you will objectively live a better life. And then when you look at life that way, it's like, oh, it's just a skill that I have to attain and a skill that I have to achieve just like going to the gym or boxing or whatever. Then your approach to it opens up in a way that wouldn't. And you're like, I'm just doing skills building. I'm just taking a, a seminar on self-confidence because self-confidence is something that you can learn and it is a skill and I'm achieving skill maturity and I'm achieving skill mastery. So always treating things that like life is, can be mastered through learning a series of skills. I, I think something that is useful for people to um, learn, I forgot already what it's like to be insecure mm -hmm. because when you're self-made, you're going to have a lot of flaws and they're going to be pointed out to you. But if you don't have to have a boss and you can kind of put food in the table, maybe take a trip once in a while and buy a nice book, the hierarchy of needs gets filled pretty quick. And when you're in that position you, and you can you know, you know, rest easy knowing you've done your part for the day, you're kind of check off all the boxes. Young people don't often have that. They don't know who they are, especially young males. They don't know their role or I can, maybe not especially. I just can't speak to, to females, of course. Um, what is that something that you talk about just building that self-confidence getting rid of that insecurity well i work so the problem you have the problem i have now is just like been there done that syndrome yeah. yeah where people ask me something i'm like you fucking how would you and then i realized i would have asked that question 15 years ago right but me i'm like how could you not know this how is this just not so completely obvious to do these things and then I have to be like, okay, so I have been there, done that syndrome. And now it isn't that I look down on people, but it's more, I can't believe you don't know this, not realizing, asshole, you had to go, you had to go like learn all this. <laughs> you're, you're 18 oh, once, you're, you're right. a moron, I was a moron, yeah, yeah. Exactly, like that's really where everyone starts. And so having a little bit more patience with people is a lot harder. But then the flip side to that too is, there, there's like a point in your life where 
it should just be that if you say something, people should not treat you like a guru, but just say, yeah, I think that, you know, if Mike talks about things, maybe I shouldn't tell him how to do social media, right? Maybe, maybe tell him certain of it, you shouldn't have tweeted that out. This is a mistake. You're, you're going to lose all your relevance. Maybe not. Maybe I'm not the guy to tell that to, right? Maybe there's just a certain sense of objective achievement that I've attained and a, a little bit of deference would be nice. So with this generation, and I was probably like this too as a kid, is that like they think they can heck, you know, you go to a game and you heckle athletes and they think they can come on like social media and heckle you. But then there's that element of mansplaining, which is real. Feminists, I do agree with them. The yes, man- it is. <clears throat> and it happens to other males. It's like, you're telling me how to do social media. Like, I'm about to fucking lose my mind here. You know, you could tell me how to maybe straighten my teeth or something. You know, like, <laughs> maybe I need braces for my underbite. Like, there are things you can tell me. But the idea that you're going to tell me how to do social media, let alone Twitter, is it, that is incomprehensible to me. It's like, you just woke up and think, I'm going to tell Mike Cernovich how to tweet. Where do, you, where do you come off doing that? And that does get on my nerves. The one thing that really... Uh, look, this, <laughs> welcome to uh, uh, autistic triggering with Michael Pallas and Mike Cernich. Here's mine. When I and this happens not exclusively to me, this a uh, common internet phenomenon. I'll ask a question, and instead of answering the question, the people will just give a speech based on whatever peripheral knowledge they have to that question. So, for example, I asked, <clears throat> "What deadlift number would you consider to be respectable?" And someone just jumps in, "You shouldn't do deadlifts; they're bad for your back." I'm getting coached by someone who had a world record and someone who's a starting strength coach. These are not idiots, and I'm sure they're doing everything in their power to make sure that I'm not injured. And if this is something that no one should be doing, I would not be doing it. It's just, but it's this sense of, well, this is my chance to seem smart to this other person. It, it, it's, I find that maddening. Or, or, you know, because I've copied your thing where, hey, if you're too smart for this poll, you know, you don't have to comment because you just ask a simple question, right? What is two plus two equal? Well, it depends. Are we using a base zero form of mathematics or a base two, which I read about in an Isaac Asimov novel? And you're just like, you, fuck it. You know what we're doing, right? So they're always like trying to jump the hypo, jump. Well, I, you know, I, this question is just too beneath me and in, in my mind and my significance in my mind. So that triggers me too. Like, yeah, I, I don't get triggered when people insult me personally. I get triggered by people confront me with their own stupidity. And the gurus are probably like, well, that's anger. We get angry by things that we see in others that we actually have in ourselves. So maybe that's your own insecurity or vulnerability or whatever. I, you know, I'll have to psychoanalyze that a little bit maybe. But that does really great under my skin. It's like, it's just a simple poll, man. You don't, you don't have to answer it. What, what is this equal? And no, nope, too smart for it. Depends what that means, but where they don't even actually sound smart. Well, it depends what the word penis means. Like, you know what it is. You know what it means. You're this, not, yeah. Like this not happened to me 20 minutes ago. Yeah. I was just on the train uh, coming home and there were two Asian women and they were speaking fluent Russian right? Which is jarring. You know, I, I, my first language is Russian. We spoke Russian at home. And I tweeted out, hearing Asian people speak Russian on the train always does a number on me. And people are like, um, did you not know that most of Russia is in Asia? And I'm like, <laughs> it's like, wait, wait which, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Right. Correct. Do you have any pretense that you do not understand what it is that I'm saying that Asian refers to a race in this uh, context other than geography. Well, it, I, I have, I have the same story. So I had a similar story where the New York times columnist wrote about how racist white men like Cernovich, obviously, according to her fetishize Asian women because they view them as like more submissive. And then they listed all these people with Asian wives and like, and Mike Cernovich has an Asian wife. And I'm like, she's Iranian, Iranian, but then of course the Twitter squad is, well, I mean, technically Iran is located in Asia. And it's like, you think you're smart, but you're not. Everybody knows it meant East Asia, Southeast Asia, every, everybody with any kind of context understands that, but they're like, well, yeah, I mean, technically Iran is in Asia. And I'm thinking, why? Well, yeah, go really go, go tell a Persian that they're Asian or that they're Arab. See what, see what kind of reaction that gets you. Yeah, but that's where they really think they're that clever. I think the expression is too clever by half where yes. you're so smart, but you're actually showing that you're not smart. You don't understand basic context and you're, you're kind of an idiot. So I get a lot of, I, my, I'm like, 
short of breath now. And after <laughs> I'm getting so like wound up now. This is like an anti, this is like a reverse therapy session where I'm just getting angry, you know, like these motherfuckers on the internet. But then meanwhile, I'll have these big shot reporters write these horrible hate pieces on me and I don't even care. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, another thing from the Huffington Post about me. Oh, what are, what are they saying now? And you roll your eyes. Rape apologist, racist, yeah. white supremacist. Yeah, slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. And they think they're, they're getting under my skin. It's like, no, set up an alt account and tell me that my wife is Asian. And I, that, <laughs> will go that will do more psychological damage to me than like your shitty hit pieces. Um, do you, I, I already know your answer, but I want to hear your thought process on this. My understanding is the entire purpose of these hit pieces isn't to get to you, but it's to basically plant a flag on you to b tell their audience, this is a bad guy, capital B, capital G. Therefore, going forward, you don't have to listen to anything he says because bad people are not capable of speaking truth somehow because that's how logic works. Um, even if he says North is up, you know, he's wrong because he's a bad person. And I think the reason they will do this to the same person repeatedly is because it doesn't stick. Because it's very hard to uh, ascribe all these horrible qualities. Then you look at someone's Twitter feed, and you're like, okay, this guy, maybe he's just terrible. But if you're saying someone's Hitler and they're just terrible, already you're lying. Right. Yeah, there's layers to it. So one is that there, so there's a cynical and a not cynical explanation. And I think for the people like WAPO, New York Times, they, with them, they just kind of look at you like Wikipedia and then, oh, that's who you are. I'm on a deadline and this is who yeah. he is. Here's a couple things he said. And then you have like the left wing gutter people where they, they really do think that they're driving you insane. They really think they're getting under your skin. They really think they're inflicting psychological pain on you. It is a sociopathy that they have. Wait, seriously? They really think they're getting oh, to you? Yeah. No, no, they, they do. Because I can't tell you how I did it or how I found it out. It might have involved a friend, you know, or somebody hacking somebody. But just they, they, there were a group texts where they thought that something was getting to me because I leaked things to certain people to find chain to custody to find out, uh, you know, how involved these certain people are were in this like kind of stalking campaign against me. And they really were like, Oh, he's losing his mind. They thought they were getting, they were getting to me. They really do. So before that personally happened to me, I thought, ah, eh, you know, they're just telling people don't trust this guy. We don't want to give him relevance. We don't want to give him clout. And that's some of it. So there are three layers there. One is just a WAPO New York times normies, who they don't know what to do with me and they know that I'm not what the far left says, but they know that if they say anything nice about me, they'll get attacked by the far yeah. left. What do we do? We're kind of like caught in the middle. And then you have the people who are putting that flag down. Don't trust this person, but they're doing it to their own audience. So it's not crossing over to, right. to my audience. So it's not landing at all. And then you do have the people who are trying to, psychologically inflict pain on you and they they think that it works and and there is that sociopathy to it that i mean remember that shitty men in media list how many yeah. men on that list for just being gross sexual harassers in some case rapists and the media kind of buried that story right so we know that there are all these men who are raping female reporters and female reporters are afraid to say anything. And raping. We're not, you're not using that word loosely. You're not no, saying no, no, no. that they're getting drunk and then people woke up and we're like, oh, what did I do? We're talking about physical force. Yeah, people can find, you know, find the list of the allegations that were made against a number of people. We know the media protected Harvey Weinstein for years. So a lot of this is not um, – it should be surprising then that there are men in media who want to inflict psychological pain against people, their subjects or their targets as a form of – like masochism and sociopathy. So there's that element to a media men where they really are a creepy, deranged class of people. Um, one of the things that you and I talked about in preparation for the new right, and you were uh, way ahead of this, I think with many other people, is you flat out told me that the media is evil, that you think in many cases it's evil. And, uh, you know, I've been harping on this for years. I think you talked about this in hoax. I, I'm going to discuss in my next book, Walter Durante, who is the subject of, of the movie uh, Mr. Smith, which was written by Andrew Chalupa, who's a hard left, you know, Democratic politician, but uh, or activist at least. But she's like, okay, this is, you know, it's a genocide that was co completely covered up uh, by the New York Times and other agencies. And you see it with um, Amy Rohrbach and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, you see it with their constant drumbeats for war uh, to invoke the Holocaust to say that we need to be in Syria. 
uh, which in any other context would be regarded as just absolutely beyond the pale, but they have no shame in doing that. Um, do you uh, share my perspective that they're losing their grip on uh, the narrative? Yeah, that's why they've gotten more desperate. That's why they've gotten more nasty and mean-spirited because people, people laugh now at hit pieces. I, I yeah. know that people have spent 50 or 60 hours on hit pieces on me like really gone into it. They flopped. The Atlantic lied to me to get me into a movie so that they could make me like connect me to Richard Spencer, who you know that I've hated for years. Yeah. And they release it and it just like flops. Like nobody's like, oh, okay, now I really, so they're like, well, we've done everything we've can. We've, we've sent our nuclear bombs. What do we do? Well, we'll just keep like launching more nukes. And that is the, that is the evil kind of nature tool because they spend a lot of time. It's bizarre because the the amount of attention spent on me by left wing media is in my own arrogant and I'm I have an ego you know I have an ego I'm not trying to pretend to be like some super humble guy I'm like why do you people spend so much time on me I don't even spend this much time on me I don't spend as much time navel gazing on me as they do and that's because they are losing control over the narrative I'm overwhelmingly popular I go out in public I've had maybe one negative encounter in three years where somebody like, oh, recognize me and gets mad. Even the, the scumbag left, I've had people do this kind of like laugh at me. They're like, Cernovich? And just like laugh. Because to them, I'm kind of a spectacle, right? So if you're uh, the dirtbag left, I'll chapel people. You know that I'm not this like evil guy, but you don't really take me seriously either. Sure. So you, it's kind of like a diversion or clown show or whatever, which is fine with me because people see each other differently. So the left is like, we're, we're saying these people are evil, and nobody's really believing it. They get more desperate. They get more unhinged to the point now that they, they go so far that they help you. The stuff about me is so absurd that God help me. If anything bad surfaces about me, people just won't believe it. They're like, Oh, this is like the latest thing because they went so hard rather than just saying, Hey, look, this guy, Mike is a flawed guy. He's troubled, problematic, da, 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 you know, keep him at arm's length distance which would be a credible position to take. No, no, they're like, he's Charles Manson reincarnated. And you're like, well, I mean, he's got a wife and two kids and lives a pretty milk toast, like dad bod life. You know, <laughs> where's the monster that I was promised? And then that sets the stage for people like me when anything surfaces, I'm like, probably a Photoshop, probably fake, probably whatever. And nobody really, nothing, nothing really sticks. Yeah, because I think they're still playing by the 90s playbook. Uh, and which is impossible to win with in a 2020 setting because, okay, if I'm going to say that you're A, B, C, D, E, and F, all I have to spend is literally five minutes on your Twitter uh, and read your tweets for myself. And it's like, this guy isn't even talking about half the things you're accusing him of. Okay, this is stupid. This I don't like. This is kind of funny. Okay, this is smart. Oh, this is a good point. Oh, he likes this person. That person's a jerk. But right away, as soon as there's any element of nuance to you or to anybody that they're trying to make into this one-dimensional figure, uh, it just falls apart as a narrative. It's just like, okay, this guy is just a jerk. Okay, fine. Why, why do I have to care about this random jerk to the point where I want to ruin his life or think about him one way or another? Well, and that's why they start, and that's why they work so hard to cancel people. So in 2014, it was inconceivable to me that unless you dox someone or threaten someone, that you would be banned from the internet. It, the culture had changed so quickly, and that's because the media would cancel people. It wouldn't work. It would actually usually make the person more popular. Right. And then they realized, well, now we have to cancel all these people with the tech company. So that's why they work so hard to no platform people because that's their only sort of remaining power. Now they've overstepped that a little bit because, you know, you have these, they're, they're trying to, they were trying to cancel like Bellagio recently, right? You have like Taylor Lorenz was on Twitter. I don't know if you fell down that rabbit hole. I did one yeah. night, but a, a little bit. Yeah. Like, there's this New York times TikTok blogger who is trying to claim that she was being harassed by so names like Bellagio, Sil. So he's, this, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Yeah, What's his yeah, name? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Basically trying to say, this guy is harassing me and he needs to be banned from Clubhouse, which is this new little like niche, clicky, clicky, invite only thing for VC people. Right. So they, they push too far now where you're like, wait, you're saying that guy's harassing you? Are you, are you out of your mind? So that they work so hard to know platform people 
that they kept trying to no platform people who no reasonable person would think would be no platformed. And that might be why some people are still around, such as myself, just because you're like, cancel this guy. He's really bad. And you're like, well, I know, but you're telling me like all these 10 other people that I've worked with for 20 years are bad too. Like, so how, you know, how bad kind of is he? But that's why the tactic changed. The tactic would go, we're going to smear this person pre-social media. You get smeared and the pressure life's over, right? doesn't matter if it's true or not. You have no way when you write a letter to the editor. And then right. got to the point where the people you smear are actually, they have two tactical advantages. One is that if you're a reporter and you go after me one time, you got to write five other articles that week. I can just write about myself and why I hate your article every day until my own people are like, move on, bro. <laughs> Give it up, sir. Yeah. And we're, okay, we, get it. we get it. We get it, right? So you, because if you're a reporter and you write about someone every day, now you look like a stalker. You look like a really kind of creepy person. So they found out that, okay, if you attack this person, they're just going to use that attack as credibility and say, well, I wouldn't be attacked if I were a nobody. So then they realize that's why you have to ban people completely from the internet. A lot of people have been unbanned fairly, um, in my view. Most people who've been banned have been unfairly. And that, then you can write about them now. And there's nothing really that they can say in response. Hey guys, Michael Miles here. Want to tell you about one of my favorite sponsors who are near and dear to my body as we speak, Sheath Underwear. S-H-E-A-T-H underwear.com. If you use code MALICE20, you get 20% off. What makes Sheath Underwear so great? They are the most comfortable boxer briefs you'll ever wear. They sit close to the body. They're made by a former vet because you know things get hot out over there in the Middle East. And when I say vet, you know that's what I mean. Um, what's great about Sheath is that they've got a dual pouch system for dudes, two pouches for two parts of your boy parts, and they keep them separated. The first time you wear them, you're going to be like, all right, what am I doing here? It's like prom night. And then you're like, oh, this is really comfortable and fun. And then you're going to be wearing them every day. Try it out. I wear them all the time, every single day. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE20, you get 20% off your order, and you'll be thinking of me whenever you touch your genitalia. Let's get back to the show. Um, I, there's a there's a scene I'm remembering that was uh, um, you were in the White House press corps room, and you know Trump was being asked repeatedly to denounce white supremacy. He denounced it repeatedly. There's a clip compilation floating around. I'm sure anyone can look it up. Where he, it's just clip after clip, and then it says Trump refuses to denounce white supremacy. He's like, I denounce it. And they just keep. They just regardless. That's the difference between having a bias and an agenda. They will just stick to the point despite the data. You were in that White House press corps room. And you asked them to denounce Antifa, who had at that point already been engaged in extreme violence, you know, bashing heads open. They're dedicated to violence by their nature. They say that violence is a justified thing to fight fascism. Uh, very quickly, the definition of fascism is, Kelly, is fascist is Kelly Conway. Um, and, and you asked them to denounce Antifa and they all laughed in your face. Mm -hmm. Can you take me to that room, what that energy was like um, and, and what it was like looking in their faces and, and making that confrontational moment? Yeah. So first of all, I think everyone should take a tour of the White House correspondence room. It's this dingy room. You, there's all this glamour on TV, right? And you think this must be some wonderful place where all the genius happens. And you walk in, it's some dingy room with undersized chairs that barely flip down. You feel like you're in an old dilapidated movie theater. You couldn't even sit here to watch a theater. And, and there's a sign seating. So everybody gets their little seat. This is where AP goes. This is where the Times guy goes. And I walk in and I'm like, this is high school. They talk like high school kids. It's not that I had, I'd never, I'd never thought, what does an intellectual do who can't get a job as a philosophy professor? So they become a journalist. I, I never had that kind of delusion. But I thought they were smarter than the average bear, right? No. They're dumber than the average bear. So they, they really are not that. It's not just that they come off that way. They're not bright people. No, they, they're not bright people. No, that, that's the biggest red pill. And that's probably why. And that's a I white pill. Well, that's probably why I don't view them as cynically maybe as you do, because I've met so many of them and they're just dumb. They're just not smart people. They're dumb people. You can't have a, a wide. That's why they're not a podcast. You, they don't, you can't have a wide ranging conversation. You can't say, hey, what's the last book you read? Oh, you know, I read The Alchemist and I thought that message of the book was, they can't even engage in like Oprah book club level literary conversations, right? 
They're okay, not, wow. Yeah. No, it's not the people you read about in Tom Wolf. It's not Christopher Hitchens and yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Avatar media. That, that's the, the 1% of the 1%. And then, so I'm in this room, and Glenn Thrush, I think, what an un, what unfortunate name, Thrush, Glenn Thrush, is in there, and they're, they're, their narrative of the day was that Trump said something nice about Hugo Duarte, right? The, the Philippines prime minister. It was a strong man. Yeah, it was a strong man. And, they, and he apparently said something nice. So they're like, oh, so why does Trump have an affinity for dictators? And everybody, you know, guffiles, oh, so funny. And I thought, well, first of all, you people are dumb. Uh, <laughs> You're, you ne- you're negotiating with people. If you're negotiating with people for better deals, you generally speaking don't insult them. That would be a good thing. Obama had said a nice thing about dictators. You can go back and you can find here's Obama praising a mean man, right? So it's dishonest at its core, but they're so dumb they don't even know they're being dishonest. Right, okay. And they really thought like we got the orange man now. He said something nice about this guy who's a bad guy and they're all laughing and they're texting each other. And I thought, wow, I'm, I've been transported to high school. And, and special needs high school. Man, you know, I don't make those kinds of jokes. So, but yeah, I've been, I've been, I'm I've, been joking. I've been, um, I've tried to be PC on that because I have a lot of, a lot of moms, you know, watch me. So there, um, I've become more compassionate about that as I've in my age. But anyway, that's a, a sidebar. I'm not, I'm not. Okay. Just, Mike has denounced me. I got it. <laughs> disavow. Disavow. <laughs> I'm not disavowing. I'm just carving out my little, my little space here. Fair. You know, it is very fair. I'm comfortable with these conversations, but, you know, just use a little bit different language. And they're, they're, ask, they're texting each other the same little questions. They're giggling. They're showing each other little things back and forth. Oh, and by the time, when I was in there, by the way, I got three text messages from Porter's Why You in the White House briefing room. Wait, so while already, they're there, they're texting you, like, sitting there? No, is other that- people, their colleagues were, because their colleagues were oh. like, here. So apparently they expected me to make a big scene, and they thought it was going to be like a big stunt or something. And I thought, so they're just gossip girls. They're literally like, so what if Cernovich is here? So what? Right? Who cares? And they're all there. They're yelling their questions. And I'm like, you know, I got to ask these people about Antifa. But of course, I'm still nervous. You know, ba-dum, ba-dum. <laughs> it's still, no matter who you are, it's hard to be hated. You're like, I'm about to make 50 to 80 people hate my guts right now. And I have to do it in a way that they can't frame me as being the bad guy. Yeah. Or he's bullying us. He went up to Kaylin Collins. He was going to hit her. Yeah, exactly. I thought he was going to be violent. So I'm thinking. Out of control, maniac. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I'm like, okay. I'm like, I have to hit them in a clean way that they can't spin it. And it has to actually be smart. It has to be good. So then I'm like, you know, so then I do the whole infamous thing. You know, why don't you ever ask about violence against Trump supporters? Karen Kecker turns at me a look of death. I think we have it captured on camera. A glare of death. So angry. April Ryan, who are you? Are you a reporter? And I can do the high school energy. Because, again, you're just in an episode of Mean Girls. The energy is, like, directed at me. And I know that they're baiting me to try to be. And I'm super polite. I'm, yes, I am, ma'am. I always call everybody sir and ma'am. That's a good uh, life tip is yes, ma'am. So everything that I say is so above board and a good, I'm like, yes, I am, ma'am, actually. Thank you. Then another <laughs> guy, it, you know, is yelling at me and I'm like, okay, I've won the exchange. So advice to men watching this, this is from the 48 laws of power and victory. Don't exceed the mark. I'm like, I gotta get the fuck out of here now. Yeah. I won- don't go past the sit. Get it. Yeah. You got, I got it. Run, get out of Dodge. I won. I, won. I got the clip. They all look like assholes. They erupted in laughter at violence against Trump supporters. They attacked me. This is amazing. I just got to get out of here now before, you know, something goes wrong. So right, as they say that, I'm like, whew, got to get in and out. So that, that's like a life hack there. Don't talk yourself out of a win. Don't talk yourself out of the sale. You want yeah. Get the fuck out. Get the fuck out now. So then I'm walking out, and this, the Playboy guy, he, um, I think is at CNN now, comes like running after me you know, putting his hands in my face, trying to like attack me. And I was like, they're, they're going to set me up. You know, this is co-intel pro. So I, I put my hands actually behind my back and like parade rest like in military. So I'm, you know, he's like putting his like, big sausage fingers in my hands, like berating me. And I'm like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So another tip too, when you're being attacked. Smile on your face. 
smile. Always smile. Yes. It drives you crazy. Back in parade rafts. And I figured if this guy hits me, we're on the White House press grounds. There, he, there's cameras on him. I don't even care what happens. I, let me interject. Uh, every guy listening to this, make sure once in your life you get punched in the face. Mm-hmm. Have your friend who's a, a boxer or MMA guy do it because it sucks. But once it happens to you once, you're like, all right, if I get punched in the face, it's not going to be a big deal. So that guy standing in your face, you're not going to be afraid. You're going to be like, okay, if I get hit in the face once more, they're going to get one punch in. It's right. going to suck. I've been through it. But you're not going to be making a rational decision based on your fear of something that's never happened. And if you stand there with a smile when they're expecting you to meet, their, yep. meet them at the same energy level, they're going to go mental because they're going to start spiraling. Yeah. So he rants just ran so the whole ran is on video somewhere and then i'm like okay thanks good talking to you mm-hmm. shake your hand afterwards and everything and i'm like Whew, got out of there you time for an oat milk latte i'm gonna walk up to la colombia up the street have a nice oat milk latte and, and decompress because it psychologically it, it was hectic because i knew they were trying to set me up i knew this guy was was hoping that i would get in his face because of who they think i am and they don't realize that and that's too where you said about getting hit in the face. I've trained and been hit in the head so many times that I have that confidence where you can yell at me and I can keep my composure because one, I don't feel like I'm weak because I'm backing down. I know that being weak would be playing into the energy. Yep. Yeah. Being weak would be playing his game. True strength is I'm just going to stand here with my hands on parade rest like a good soldier taking a dressing down. And I'm not going to take any ego blow from that psychologically. And if he hits me, whatever, you know, I'll wake up and then I'll get him in jail and everything. And that'll be even bigger win. So I got in and out, but that's enemy territory, man. That was really behind enemy lines. Um, how are you surprised that you never got kicked off of Twitter? <sighs> yes and no. So if five years ago, I would have bet that I hadn't been banned from Twitter. I don't think I would have taken that bet. Right. I don't think I would have taken that, but, but, but I'm not surprised because I've always been kind of good as a lawyer, like reading in between the lines. Yeah. It's like, okay, so you can't use the word tranny. You're, you'll get banned. Okay. Well, I don't care to use the word anyway. Right. I don't need to talk like that anyway. Okay. Well, you can't use like this word. Okay. Um, you shouldn't insult. You shouldn't call Muslim savages. Well, great. I like Muslims. Half my family's Muslim. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to talk like that anyway. And then, so then I just realized, okay, so this is kind of the new thing. And then the big one I saw, and I warned Laura Loomer about this, but she didn't listen. Laura doesn't listen? That doesn't sound right. <laughs> right impossible. impossible. <laughs> Unheard of. So she would tag Ilhan Omar in tweets. And, I was, and then she would DM me to retweet him. And I was like, first of all, I will never retweet anything that tags these people in a mean tweet. Because that's going to be called inciting harassment. Target, yeah, target harassment, yep. And I said, two, you should not be tagging them in a tweet ever. Don't ever say what you have to say. So Twitter's actually pretty good at letting you say what you have to say. Yeah. If you want to say, you know, here's a, here's a pretty dodgy thing that's pretty controversial. As long as you're not like tagging people and making it look like you're personalizing it, it's actually pretty fair. The, the rules are pretty fair. But the minute you, but now, by the way, this only works one way because there are people who will just tag me and send me the worst things and nothing ever happened to them. But then as a lawyer, I'm comfortable with the rules being rigged. You know that if you're a lawyer, you're, yep. you might get a judge who's like, he doesn't care what the law said. He's going to make up his own little rules yep. because he doesn't like you or your client. And that's just the way the law is. It's not this objective platonic man in a robe or a woman in a robe. And they're really trying to get to the truth. They're thinking, how can I get to the outcome that I want? Yeah. So for me, I don't melt down. Well, they can target me for her. Cause you've seen what people have done. I mean, it's been pretty awful beyond yes. any, any decency. And I, I just know that that's the rules though. So I'm not like, oh, but I should be able to tag them now and get my people after them or whatever. So you got to just take it on the chin if you're right wing or conservative. And, the, you know, and then the flip side too is you have to, like, don't let them caricature you. So I don't like to be, I don't like to be critical of my friends, um, especially when they've been persecuted in a way. But I'll just say there are friends of mine who would tweet things and it's like, if you tweet it once, it looks like you're making a good point. But if you tweet it like every day for a week, it's kind of like, oh, this is like anti-woman week, you know, or this is yeah. like anti-Jew week. You're like, you look, you look that way. You look like an anti-Semite. You look, you look fixated. Yeah. 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 Like I know you're not, 
but it's like every day for a week you're gonna you know tweet about this thing you know that you're you're, you're creating the caricature of yourself that isn't even true so like don't create the caricature of yourself so i'll go do like i'll talk about things that are maybe controversial but i'm not going to talk about it like every day in a way that allows me to create a caricature of who i am or what i believe do you think joe biden stole the election well probably another reason i'm not banned on social media is because i have the delicate sensitivities to word things differently too which is that the and trump retweeted this because it's a good tweet which was you've never had an other than george w bush but remember ross pro ran against them so you've never had an incumbent president and i don't know how many hundreds of years have the political party that they're part of gain house seats but then they lose then they lose the election right usually it's a route all the way around yeah and trump's not on the ballot in 2018 GOP loses 40 House seats. Trump's on the ballot. The GOP loses, or they gain 12 House seats. Yeah. 14 or some, some amount. The, we watch now the gaslighting in real time, which is everybody remembers Georgia quit counting on election night because of a gas leak or a water leak. Everybody remembers that. Well, now it turns out they, the, the story is it was a urinal, a urinal leak. So we went from a pipe burst which we all remember if you watch the election, he's like, wait, Georgia's going to stop counting. So we know that Georgia said there's a pipe burst and they're sending over vote monitors home to, oh, no, we never sent the vote monitors home. That was, you say, all just left spontaneously. And it was a urinal, not a pipe. So I, I don't know that he didn't get 80 million votes, but I do know it wasn't a free and fair election. I know that if this were happening in Belarus, we would be demanding that Trump condemn the elections in Belarus and there'd be demands for a recount. Far too many irregularities. The testimony in Michigan where you had eyewitnesses saying, like, I saw votes being changed. The media wouldn't cover it. Now we're just supposed to pretend like that testimony didn't happen. Now, it could be those witnesses were lying, right? I'm open to that possibility, too. But there's no cross-examination of them. It's just let's pretend that not enough people saw that. We'll call everyone who pretends that there's evidence of voter fraud a liar. We'll flag their stuff, maybe ban them, even though testimony made under oath is evidence. It's just law 101. So the irregularities are crazy. The numbers don't make sense to me. That, now, the flip side to that, the counter to that would just be that Trump was, I mean, he restored democracy. A record number of people came out to vote for him. I didn't think he was going to get close to 75 million votes. I thought it'd be another barn burner like 2016. So a record number of people do, did turn out, and that's just a Trump effect. So I, so I can see – I do have – so let me put it this way. Sincerely and not even just trying to avoid a social media ban. I can believe that Biden won. There are so many irregularities and so much evidence that we're all supposed to pretend that we didn't see – we're all supposed to pretend that we weren't told a pipe burst. We were all supposed to tend to pretend that the media didn't tell us election monitors were told to go home. That I don't, I'll never trust this election. I'll just never trust it. It's just fascinating because we were spent three years investigating 2016 and, you know, Russian uh, interference and so on and so forth. If you go to Wikipedia in 2016, the first paragraph says uh, that Russians were found to have interfered in the election. Well, interfered, what does that mean? Well, they bought ads on the dark web. Okay, <laughs> who's ever, I mean, to get to the dark web, how many voters know how to get on the internet, let alone the dark web? Um, and then we're told explicitly, I forget who it was, they said these exact words, that 2020 has been the most secure election in American history. First of all, how is it that Trump, who's Hitler, managed to do this amazing switch from if he's in power, thanks to Russia or interference, why would he make the election secure? And he's in charge and the Republican government is in charge, number one. Number two is um, how are you in a position to make that declaration less than a month after the election? If you want to say this election was perfectly secure, which is a plausible position to make, shouldn't you investigate it for a few months before you're comparing it to literally every election in history? Or at least to do a real debunk. So we were told that there's no evidence of voter fraud. And you're like, well, no, I mean, this, this Indian woman who owned an IT store in Michigan and was beautiful, I was starstruck, um, you know, says these things. Maybe she's wrong. Maybe she's lying. But you can't just pretend that she doesn't exist. You can't just pretend that she doesn't exist and she didn't give this testimony. 
but that's what they're doing. So if you're pretending that these people don't exist, you're not refuting what was said, then that tells me that you're covering something up. If yeah. you told me on the night of the election, and you can go back and find these old articles, the Atlantic Journal Constitution, ABC News, multiple local reporters in Atlanta said, okay, 1030, people were sent home. The vote monitors were sent home. They're not going to count anymore. Oh, and a pipe burst. And then a declaration comes out last night. No, we never told people to go home. And then the media now will say, oh, it's been debunked that people were told to go home, even though they were the ones who reported it. Friends of mine who were vote monitors reported it. But no, 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 just move on to the next little thing that they, they told us and pretend everything was debunked. So you're right. Th there's no, the whole like vote things or um, the ballots underneath the black table in Georgia. I know that video can be deceptively edited and taken out. Of, I told, show me the full three hour video. I need yeah. to be able to right now watch the whole video. No, no, just trust that we, the foxes guarding the hen house are telling you the truth about how many hens are left over, right? That's what they're saying is trust us. No, how about you just show us in the whole video? Let me just watch the whole video and then I can say, oh, here's where they were put in. They were there for eight hours. They weren't moved. Nothing untoward happened. It was just normal procedure. Okay, cool. And I'm one of the reasonable ones. So, yeah, I, right. Yeah. You know, and so, so I'm willing to accept that Biden won. I, I really am. But not when I see all the shenanigans happening at all. And then we're being ga gaslit, which people resent, which I resent. I resent being told that the pipe in Georgia didn't burst and let's just pretend and not do any follow-up reporting and say, well, then why was it reported by every media outlet right. that a pipe burst? What happened? Where did it go wrong? Who told you the pipe burst? Da, 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 right? No, not, no, it was just a urinal leak, all a big misunderstanding. Everybody like needs to move on. No. So we are being gaslit in a, in a major way, in a way that I think people resent. And it's a way that I resent and that makes me quite angry. Um, I'm very hopeful about the future of this country, and I'm very hopeful about the losing power of the cathedral. Let me give you an ex and one of the reasons is there's very little accountability for some of these people. And because there's no accountability, that means that people who are not good uh, stay in their jobs, and that's very deleterious for someone who's trying to have a monopoly on public discourse. Uh, James O'Keefe just released a video last week, which was a taped phone call with Jeff Zucker and the head people at CNN, where they were basically deciding to how to avoid covering the Hunter Biden laptop story um, and a priori. And they're like, well, it's in the New York Post, so we're going to quote this. Law. And the head CNN director, a uh, head political director of CNN, I Googled him. He was fired from Yahoo, uh, Yahoo, because he had said, hot mic, that Mitt Romney doesn't care if there's a pool 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 full of black kids who drown or something to oh, that effect. Wow. And it's like, wait, wait, in your mind, Mitt Romney is this hardcore extreme racist. You're fired. And now you're running things at CNN as opposed to you should be running a hot dog stand or something. I mean, that is of all people, to, uh, that's such an outrageous comment, but instead they, Joanne reads another example. You cite her very often. It's like, Oh, I, I'm going to gay bait. Uh, Charlie Crist and some other people in these just kind of really nasty ways. And then it's like, oh, I don't remember. I'm going to call the FBI. And now you're getting promotion instead of this is really inappropriate to be kind of gay baiting people. Because uh, you and I know people who are closeted. We would not ever out them because we don't know their circumstances, politicians. Maybe they're in a southern state or whatever, where if they're out, that they'd be voted out of office. and But they're not voting against gay rights or something like that. Um, this is what makes me hopeful about the fact that they're going to lose. Is that your perspective that they're going to lose? Yeah, the timelines are different. And I can, I can see it going um, any number of ways. Which, So one thing like with the media's power is the media still has immense power when they go all in with saturation coverage. Yes. So for example, if I get five hit pieces on me, it's, it's fine for me. But if I get 500 a day for three months, I'm going to have to leave my house because I, I'll get killed by the random – you know, lunatic. That's why, that's what drove the Mercers out of politics is the death threats, the real death threats, because they have Navy SEALs and everybody, ex-Navy SEALs defending them. So real, you know, not like, oh, I'm on the internet and somebody said something mean to me. So the media still has that power when they go all in, like they did on Trump, that mass media mind control still exists. So in the insular case, they don't really have any power, but they used to have a ton. They used yeah. to be, your, your life's over because of one article in the New York Times, now you need like a thousand articles. So that, that's a good sign. That, that's, really, that's really a good bellwether. The other side too, though, is 
you know, it's like the you almost feel like we're marching to gulags too. Like the yeah. Soviet Union is better today than it was when Solzhenitsyn wrote, but they still had to go through the Solzhenitsyn period. You know, I just mentioned that because I have I was looking at his book when I was moving stuff around earlier today, and I I do feel like we're going to enter a dark period. And that will come out of it better because I believe in the immortal soul of people. I believe that love ultimately wins. I believe hope prevails. But I think in the short term, it's going to get pretty bad. Well, uh, interesting. I, I think in the short term, it's going to get a lot better. And here's why. And I want to hear your thoughts. Um, this was my kind of breakdown. I know you retweeted the, the thread, which is for a long time, Nancy Pelosi would get on TV and say, Mitch McConnell is the devil. Mitch McConnell sucks. Give me money to get reelected. And she's talking with a straight face. Her constituents hate Mitch McConnell. She is fighting him on some level in Washington. And Mitch McConnell gets on TV and says, Nancy Pelosi's the devil. Give me money. Let me get reelected. Let me fight her. And her constituents would be like, yeah, she doesn't represent our values. Here's some money. While this is happening, they're having this wrestling you know, heel, I guess each is the respect of heel, the other one. The New York Times, Harvard Law, Washington Post, they can lob grenades from safety and all the conservatives will be focused on Nancy Pelosi instead of the New York Times or Harvard. The second this election turned, I have not seen any or very little other than the boomers focus on Biden. It's all been on CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post, that you guys are the enemy. They are not training. And this, in my view, is unprecedented. And this is why I am so hopeful in well, the short term. Well, and that, yeah, I liked your thread. I thought your thread was good that people understand now that it's, there, there's even a meme, like a boomer meme going around where they say, if you put two, two, a hundred ants over here and a hundred ants over there, they'll mind each other's business. But then if you shake up the ants, they fight each other. Well, why are the ants mad at each other? Why are the ants not mad at the person who's shaking them up? Right. Yeah. That, right. And that really is the media. Most people, they're just living their lives, man. They they don't no no. That's why I hate when when my side is like demon raps. Like no, they're not. They're just living their <laughs> life, dude. They don't know anything about Twitter. They don't you know they don't really know much about Antifa because the media they watch doesn't cover it. They're not demon rats, dude. They're just not. And or or just the idea that somebody's gonna yell this is MAGA country and put a noose on Jesse Smollett. You wouldn't even have the South. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even that, that stuff like that wouldn't even happen in the South, let alone Miracle Mile in Chicago. Right. So that that is that is a good awakening. But the institutional structural power of the left with the lockdowns, pretty bad. I mean, they've destroyed oh, yeah. people's livelihoods and they've gotten away with it. And that was done at the state and local level. And that's what gives me a certain amount of pessimism. So I'm simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic. So the optimism is from your point, which is the media tried to gaslight us to go to war in Syria with, uh, you know, they attacked me because I didn't buy the official story and claimed that I was, you know, friends with Ergo Owen. But then meanwhile, they're, they're all friends with him now and want us to go to war with Russia because Russia flew a plane over Turkey. And you're like, make up your minds, people, you yeah, know, yeah. who's the apologist for Forge regime. But <laughs> Right, because you see it. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what like blows my mind. If if I don't believe the chemical gas attack story, that means I'm an apologist for Turkey, which means I'm evil. But then if I don't want us to go to war with Russia because Russia flew a plane over Turkey, oh, but they're a NATO ally. Now suddenly I have to be pro Turkey. It's like th there's no actual coherence to the worldview other than death and destruction. Yes. So it's going to be really hard to WMD hoax the country again. They're going to try, though. They're going to really try to get us into Syria. That, to me, is, is we'll revisit the conversation. So if in six but months— can I, can I interject because I want to get your thoughts on this? Don't you think the fact that so many people on the right, and historically the right, or at least in the last 20 years, has been the source of a lot of these wars because there are so many young men and women from the right who are in the military, they're on to this before Biden's even been sworn in? Right. And we have, we're going to have a much weaker uh, military. We're not going to have the post 9-11 military, which was among the most. I mean, you had people who could have done anything. You had Pat Tillman. I'm not going to play in the NFL. I'm an elite athlete. I'm going to go yeah. arm ranger, right? When you're not going to get that post 9-11 right wing army that they had, which was truly an elite army. It's what they've done and accomplished. Mind blowing. There's so many great people you can talk to about that, too. You're not going to get that because our side, maybe they'll do it for the glory or the adventure, but it's not for the patriotism. Right. So, like our side, people watching us might say, you know what? I, I want to live that hero's journey. 
I want to go be a Navy SEAL. I want to go be a Ranger. I want to go be Special Forces because I think it'll be like a cool thing to do, a great way to live your life. And I'm, and I'm supportive of that view. But it isn't because I'm a patriot. I'm going to go fight for my country. Nobody talks like that anymore. I thought I had a moment like that in Epiphany when I was at my grandfather's funeral. They had all the VFW people come in and they still do the military burial rites because he was in World War II or the World War II era, you know, whatever the case is. And I thought there's no young person there. There's nobody who was in Iraq or Afghanistan who they want to go perform military burial rites for people anymore. They're just kind of bitter and jaded or they're happy because they're like, well, I got my college paid for. It was a cool ride, so to speak. But this whole patriotism shit, no, especially with Biden in office. Right, especially with Biden. I was just going to say that, yeah. Yeah, no, you're not going to get the cream of the crop enlisting to fight the wars because I'm fighting for my country, you know, yeehaw. That's all over. And so that's good, but then that's also bad because that does make us weaker, more susceptible to an attack. So I'm a mishmash of optimism and pessimism. Are you optimistic as I am that the, maybe in the medium term, certainly not in the short term, that the university system is going to lose its luster and its uh, um, cultural clout? No, and I'll tell you why. People still want to go to, to college, because most people have gone to college to party anyway. The idea, you know, you had to have it as a credential. Most people just want to go to party anyway. I think that the, the lack of luster is in the terms of expertise where you see someone like Paul McFall or whatever, or Michael McFall, whatever his name is, that dopey Russiagate truther who's a PhD professor at Stanford. And I don't think now if you tell some normie, this Harvard professor has said that here's the good guys and here's the bad guys. 20 years ago, that would have had some cachet to it. So no, it, that cachet is over. The That's idea- great. Yeah, okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm Condoleezza Rice and I'm a professor at Stanford. Go fuck yourself, you know? <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit other, other than like your little click anymore. And Twitter, by the way, was a great equalizer there because yes. you just like, I can go look at this because it works both ways. If you read me or you on Twitter and then you read a Stanford poli sci professor, you're like, those, those guys are smarter than that guy. So yeah. you're telling me that I need to respect this former ambassador to Russia, McFaul, he's at Stanford, the Hoover Institution, all these like it. You're like, this guy's a fucking idiot. You know, he doesn't say anything insightful, anything narrative challenging, anything that makes you pause and reflect on how you've lived your life and your life choices or your geopolitical strategy. So Twitter has been really the great democratic equalizer, the greatest invention ever, because you're an anarchist, not a Democrat. So I would just say that it's been the greatest equalizer for democracy in a good way because you do realize we were living in an aristocracy that we call the democracy yeah you're right oligarchy that we call the democracy and now we're kicking the aristocrats out yeah and and it's and, and this is why i think it's key we're the ones having fun if you look at like lawrence tribe and um uh, David Frum and all these people who look like, you know, menopausal lesbians and you look at their feeds, these guys are not thriving. They're not enjoying themselves. There's lots of reasons. You and I both get very upset about lots of things happening in the country, but we're still thriving as human beings. These people are not at all anything other than miserable yentas. Someone came at me yesterday on Twitter. I'm sure you're going to agree. And they're like, blah, 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 Trump, blah, Trump. I go, I promise you, or I said, I'll bet good money. You'll be as disgruntled about politics a year from now as you are today. Yeah, no, I read every tweet and I saw that one too. And that is where I've also made a, a, you know, I hate the word brand positioning or whatever, but I do try to emphasize motherfuckers. I'm having fun. I'm a drink. I got a hot wife. We have a lot of sex. We have kids. Like my movie's doing well. My books are doing well. So I don't buy into the doom and gloom that's with MAGA. The Republic is going to end if Kelly Loeffler, I, like, I can't even say these people's names. If Kelly Loeffler isn't reelected and David Perdue's not elected, the Republic is over. And I'm, So even me to the, like the MAGA people, I'm like, go fuck yourself. No, it isn't. You'll still have opportunity. Shit will still be bad. They're going to do things you don't like. They're going to do things you do like. And that's your life. And so I've, I've even like, I don't know, maybe I was high on mushrooms or something one time, but I was reading on my tw- tw- uh, Twitter feeds and I go, do political people not listen to music? <laughs> right. 
Yeah, is there like, do you, have you ever had a, like a chocolate bar? Like, does right. nothing give you joy? <laughs> right, like Dave Reboy, you know, is in his jazz. Thank God. <laughs> You're like, you, you don't, you don't ever just be like, you know, for the next hour, I'm gonna like listen to Rolling Stones or watch an old Led Zeppelin concert or something. Do you people have no joy to be that like French concept? For all the cultural insecurity of the French, you don't just have a joy for life sometimes or even for like a moment. No, no, life is too serious. They are killjoys. And that's where, and I've said this before, is if you're right wing, you have to not only live a, a aspirational life, but you have to show that to people. And show, look, man, we're having, we're the ones having fun. We're the ones enjoying our lives. Those people are the killjoys. Do you want to be with David Fromm and his, you know, because they always, you know, they never show a full body. And then you, you like, go on Google Images. And you're like, dude, that guy's a balloon, man. <laughs> like, David, no wonder you're angry. You have no testosterone. You're pumping estrogen, probably lactating. And diabetes. Yeah, diabetes. You're on a 50 different blood pressure medications. Just come to the gym with me. Take a hike. It's not like I'm ripped or anything, but I can do a hike. You know, we can go take a little hike, go to Alaska maybe, look at some wildlife. There's so much beauty in the world, right? They don't like they don't post music they're listening to. They don't they don't talk about books like with all these reporters. Like I have a pretty good bookshelf where if you're a reader, you probably have seen some of them. Yeah. They're just like, you know, no, they don't they don't read books. They don't read outside of their limited domain. And they're a joke. And and the best thing that we can do is emphasize that they are a joke. They're not fun. They're not smart. They're not better than we are. And they're, they're not even living life at 11. They're not even living life in an aspirational way at all. Here, I, I already could hear the voices in my head, and this is what they're going to say. Well, it sounds like you're not really that happy at all. Anyone who's really happy doesn't talk about how happy they are. You're just trying to cope, bro. You're ass mad that Trump lost, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you're overcompensating. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I would say that a lot. Like, you must – the fact that you – are so self-confident is proof to me that you must have a little penis and you're trying to make up, you're trying to make up for us. I've heard that for, you know, and that's just something you have to laugh at too, because the, the idea that, especially in a social media era, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to just see that it's hard to fake for as long as I've been on. I, I would have to be the greatest actor in the world to fake, you know, because people are like, you're unhinged. You're this. And I'm like, I've tweeted every, maybe I'm cause I tweet that might be evidence I'm unhinged, but it's not like this, like tweet to be able to show up and consistently like message and navigate the world that I've done for the number of years I've done while having like a family life and making movies and writing yeah. books is probably the exact opposite of unhinged. It probably is like, that's a pretty hinged, straightforward, you know, steady living life free of drug and alcohol abuse and everything else. But that's not how they'll ever see it because that would force them to look inward. Yeah. It's, like the, it's the fact like, I hate that guy. Why do you hate him? Because he's got something that you want. But you're afraid, you know, because we talked about memetics, I think, with the new ride and the idea that most people don't know memetics is in Rene Girard, not memes, which is, I don't know what I want. I see what Mike Malice has. That's what I think I want, but I don't have that, so therefore I'm mad at Mike Malice. Or therefore he can't really have it because he's bad yeah. and I'm good. Or he's under delusion. He has, he's living under false, like Marcusa. You know, you're living under false consciousness, and I have real consciousness, and real consciousness would be like all of life is woe and struggle and pessimism and, and everything else versus just saying like, no, I'm jealous because that guy's living a life that I kind of wish I was living, but I'm afraid – to live that life because I'm afraid to dream. I'm afraid to take a chance. I'm afraid that I might fail and then I would have to know the pain of failing. So because of that, I'll wallow in the misery of never succeeding and never even trying. Most people are very scared to be able to simply say, I want to be happy. And they're trained that it's wrong to say this. And I do everything to tell them, no, 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 say it and say it defiantly and fight for it because it's not going to be easy, but it's pretty damn awesome. It's not like a Coke orgy. It's just like Epicurus, like, oh, I'm reading a book with my wife. Or, hey, I saw this movie. The movie kind of sucked. Then me and my buddy went to dinner. It was okay. But we made memories together. And it's, it, you know, that we're social animals, that basic human contact is the kind of thing that carries you for years. And also to get out of the idea that you want what someone else has. So me, yeah. 
by a lot of accounts, my life is pretty conventional. I wake up, get a coffee, do some tweeting, hang out with my kids, hang out with my wife. I don't see the Tate brothers and their Ferraris and be like, I hate the Tate brothers. They're, I'm like, good for them. You know, I hope they're having fun because I know because I've lived a kind of part of your lifestyle and I actually don't like that life. Um, you're around people. There's always drama. People are trying to get at you. Yeah. I like living a more Romanesque senatorial life where I lay low, smoke my cigars, hang out with my family, read my books, talk, you know, talk to people like you, banter with you. That's what I like to live. But that starts with the idea that you do a conscious lifestyle design. Because yeah. if you say, I want to live like the Tate brothers, but you're afraid to admit that because you've been told that that's actually douchey and you shouldn't want money. You shouldn't want to be around hot women. So now you're like, Oh, now I'm unhappy because I want that, but I'm afraid to admit that I want it. Or maybe I don't know that I want it. And then your brain is just spiraling around in this confused, bitter place all the time where instead just say, I want that and then go get it. And if you decide that what you, upon getting it, you don't want it, then go get something else. But you, but you have to admit like, like what, another thing I tell guys, I go, if you want to be a douchebag, it's okay to be a douchebag. It's okay to pop your collars <laughs> and wear a pink shirt and wear the glasses. It's okay. Just, you know, don't commit any crimes or whatever. It's okay. And most people can't. Or I'll even say it's okay to be in a way, because we struggle with cognitive dissonance. Well, I'm a good person on that. I go, you know, it's okay to just not really care if people think you're a good person. Because my yeah. Shauna, poor Shauna, <laughs> her more than me because she thinks I'm a good person and because I am I mean I am but yeah. the, the idea to her is it's stressful that people don't think I'm a good person but then I'm okay with people thinking I'm a bad person so because what, it's not personal they're not reacting to you and then if you do that you really radically alter your life in, in a way that you you know as Gorilla Mindset says live life on your own terms I don't tell people how to live I just tell people those are your terms and that's how you should aspire to live your life. And that's how I aspire to live mine. Uh, Mike, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? <sighs> My favorite part of the interview was the email from you inviting me on the podcast. I said, am I getting punked? Is that, am I really at Michael Malice podcast level? That, <laughs> so I had to tweet out the screen cap of the email to get confirmation from you that it was real. So just the fact that we have made it real is the best part. You are welcome. 